think that there's tremendous opportunity here. I kind of look at it a little bit like the wild, wild west. You guys have got a lot happening here, and it really is it's growing in so many ways because you've got a lot of people coming from the outside, tradespeople coming from the outside and, and finding a new quality of life here. So now you've got a great pool to draw from in terms of artisans, materials that are coming here now. So I think um, there's tremendous opportunity here, and I always like to go where it's uncharted territory. So yeah, I'm very interested, but it has to be the right project for me. Alan, we're rolling. Good. All right. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Today we have an amazing guest. Patrick and I are super excited. And um, let's get the show on the road. Yeah, before we start, make sure to subscribe, like, share the video, and uh, stay tuned for more episodes. Now, with further ado, welcome to the show, Windsor Smith. Um, joining us today as an innovative force in the design industry, whose elegant interiors rethink homes for modern day living. In this ever-changing world, she integrates the elements of a home with larger themes connecting us with our families, friends, and larger community. This is more important than ever. She reinvents the design process and ushers in a new way of luxury living. With an illustrious career spanning over two decades, she has captivated the world with her transformative approach to the interior design world. From luxurious residences to stunning commercial spaces, her work embodies the perfect blend of timeless elegance and modern sophistication. She was named by Veranda as one of the top 25 design influencers. She's created iconic homes for leaders in the entertainment and business world. In addition to her design work, she's also an author in which she's captured her design approach with her book, Windsor Smith Homefront, Design for Modern Living. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Windsor Smith. Thanks Damn. for being here. Yeah. <laughs> That's the intro. Did I do all that? I'm only... 27 <laughs> how did that happen oh we love it thank you so much yeah thank you so much for for coming um we, we, we are we are very excited and and we had the pleasure to work with you we'll talk touch base on that in a, in a little bit here but tell us a little bit about your background your experience for um the listeners and the people watching who don't know you and um let's get started well i was basically not hireable so I was looking for a profession that I could stay at home and be a, a stay-at-home mom. And I had been fascinated by uh, antiques and found objects. And I was working on a house of my own at the time, my first house. And I was traveling around to flea markets and then going to Europe quite a bit and was buying really interesting objects to build into the architecture of my own home. And so from there, it kind of blossomed into a design career where I was first fascinated by finding unique things to incorporate into a home to make it more special. But then it, people were saying, you're finding everything for my house. Can you just come up and take a look at my house? So I kind of snuck in the back door of, uh, of design, per se. And I have always been fascinated with the architectural aspect of it. So I was never really an interior designer who moved into architecture. I was really in love with that piece of it first. So... Very interesting, and um, like Max said, uh, I want to touch on that first. Like we got, uh, we had the pleasure of uh, selling one of the houses you designed, your first ever Arizona project. Um, we did a broker open. You were there personally. Um, pretty much every top broker was in town. Um, that and everybody said this is different. This is better than anything we've seen in a very long time in Arizona. What do you think on that specific property? made it stand out so much that we, I mean, we do a lot of these broker opens and the feedback was, you know, off the chart. So what do you think was the biggest difference between this house and some stuff that most people see out here? I think that as I've grown as a designer, I think I really understand the ethos of a family and everyone is different, right? So because this house was not built as a spec project because it was built for a family it, and uh, people who had a very specific taste level and aesthetic, I approached it in a way that was incredibly unique to them. So I think what made it stand out is that there's no one formula. There's, it's not grand animals, right? It's that you have to listen 
to the desires and and measure the aesthetic level of who you're working with. And then you take that to a level that they couldn't do on their own, right? So they already have good taste, which you'll find with a lot of the people that you're selling these luxury houses to. But how do you get them to the highest level of living? And that's where I come in. So I think with that particular project, we, I had the good fortune of getting involved very early on when it was just in its framing stage. And the idea of that house was that it was going to be more of a modern farmhouse. But when I saw the property and knowing the client in the way that I do, I understood it, that I needed something that had a more European and classic approach to how they were going to live in the house. So all of the architectural details had to have some sense of provenance, which is very difficult to do in a brand new construction. Right? So all my references were architectural references of classic structures, classic architects like Palladio. So I wasn't coming from it to that, from the angle of, oh, I'm doing a modern house for this client. I came from it, how can I make this very sophisticated? Because these are European travelers. These are people who've seen the whole world. They've seen the most beautiful homes. So how was I going to select materials and create a new vocabulary that belonged uniquely to them? So that's how I approached that differently. So when people were seeing it, they were like, oh, this is a new vocabulary. But for me, it starts as a very personal journey with uh, a family that it, I, when I look at these houses, it should be a one of one. Right. Yeah, definitely was, definitely was. I mean, the feedback was amazing. I think the, the other thing that you just said, it was, it's, it's you came in and you kind of knew what it was, but you, you still, it was all new, right? Like it, it wasn't like a brand new, like it was, very sophisticated on a level I think that you know we see a lot in in other states right in, in Florida and LA mm -hmm. um, and, and California um, tell us a little bit about the difference between a spec home and a custom home how do you approach these differently well obviously you throw more money at the plaster of a custom home <laughs> than you do in a spec home because a spec home is designed to reach a broad audience and it's also designed to be built economically so that there's profit built into it, right? But I've been building um, very special, high-level spec houses for several years now. The first one I built, well, I had the good fortune that Gwyneth Paltrow bought it, and I've done several since then. And I always approach them, much to my husband's chagrin, I approach them like they're going to be a one-of-one, one, and that the person who will find that house and will inhabit that house will understand it completely, and then money's not the problem. Money's not the issue. They see themselves in that house, they're emotional about that house, and that's where the sale comes from, and that's where we always set unprecedented numbers with these houses. But it's scary to do that if you're doing it strictly for money. I do it for more than that. I do it because I'm building a, a body of work that feeds my, my print work, it feeds my editorial work, it feeds my own books. So I'm looking always to create something that's really unique in those properties. So they find their audience. It's amazing. I think, I think houses find their owners just as much as their owners find their houses. It's interesting that you say that you have, um, have the development component uh, that you're passionate about too. Mm -hmm. um, as of right now, how many projects do you have going on the, on the development side? Are these all in, in Los Angeles? Are you potentially thinking of, you know, maybe we do something together in Arizona? Yeah, well, listen, I'm very intrigued. You strike while the skillet's hot because I'm really uh, uh, in love with what happened here. And I love the response that it got. So I think that there's tremendous opportunity here. I kind of look at it a little bit like the wild, wild west. You guys have got a lot happening here, and it really is, is growing in so many ways because you've got a lot of people coming from the outside, tradespeople coming from the outside and, and finding a new quality of life here. So now you've got a great pool to draw from in terms of artisans, materials that are coming here now. So I think um, there's tremendous opportunity here, and I always like to go where it's uncharted territory. So, yeah, I'm very interested, but it has to be the right project for me. Uh, this isn't, you know, this is my first rodeo. I've been doing this for a long time. And for me, it starts with the team. You know, the location, what beautiful aspects of the environment are, you know, come with the project. And then who is the end user? So I think that's, you know, to keep our eye on that ball. I always do an imagined end user when I'm doing spec projects for myself because you don't have that client, right? right. 
So for me, I, I remember one time I was doing a project and I was like, well, if the Sultan of Brunei and the Duchess of Windsor had a love child, this would be their house. <laughs> I mean, but that opened me up to all kinds of really interesting things. It sounds like a crazy story, but actually that was my go-kart because I could draw Moorish influences, right, for the Sultan of Brunei. I could draw very um, high-level sort of proper and classic elements, you know, so for the Duchess of Windsor, because that's such a legacy. So it gave me, like, my direction of where I was going to go. So I need a story. I need a narrative. And if I, if I don't get it from my private clients where I'm doing a project very specific to them, then I create it. Create the client. Um, when, you, when you go ahead and start, like, these projects, how do you balance – because there's always the functionality versus design, right? A lot of stuff that looks good might not be as functional on a daily. Like, right. how much of a balance do you do? Like, how much can be, like, not functional, but it just needs to be done because it's part of the design versus you have to, you know, pick functionality of design. Like, how do you balance those two things? Well, I mean, I think that, at first and foremost, it should be aspirational, right? So someone might say, oh, I like a million closets. But I've worked with people before where... When you have those deep closets, because we can talk about the closet of this particular house, because I think it was a very interesting sort of study, right, in right. closets. So I look at closets, and I say, okay, with what I know today versus what I knew when I started out, I think that closets that are, you know, sort of a big chamber that doesn't have natural light, that doesn't have a lifestyle component to it, is a trap for things that you're going to buy and throw into that space and never really get to. So what I tried to create in this, in this house was I was trying to create an environment that, you, that getting dressed was sexy and that you wanted to, like when you buy, you know, your favorite pair of Brunello pants, right, you want to hang them in a way that you actually really appreciate them and look at them and look at the tailoring and see them for several days, right? And you want to get excited. You get that perfect leather jacket that you were, you know, really like, you know, I want, that's going to change my life. And I want to see that in that space. So I feel like creating more of a boutique approach to a closet was something I had not done before, but I really love it. I love what happened there and the fact that you want it to be in that space. You want it. You want to be. It inspires a couple to get dressed together. And, you know, because my husband, he, like, comes and parks right by the right by when I'm getting dressed. I'm like, come on. <laughs> you don't need to see the Spanx, all right? <laughs> but literally, like, it's interesting. He's like, oh, I like that. Or, oh, that, you look great. Like, it's, it inspires conversation. It inspires, like, a sexy relationship. And I thought, well, let's just build that in. How can that go wrong? And for everyone who, who doesn't have a visual right now, who doesn't know the property, you know, what's you interesting? Curious? Aren't you curious? Yeah, well, we're going to we're gonna include pictures of, uh, okay. of uh, Windsor's signature project that we, that we sold um, in the link and so you guys can check client. it out loves art, right? Yeah. So they're well-traveled. So what did we do? We leaned all of their prized photographs and drawings against the back wall so you could literally hang the clothes and in the backdrop of that, you had beautiful art. So what a great combination to sort of like take a room that would normally be a bunch of hangers that's all, you know, you can't get in another one in there and you have to kind of edit and try to ram something else. And again, it was one of the most talked about rooms in that house like you know we we always see like social media obviously right so we see a lot of agents people that walk the house and almost everybody did some sort of a story or something about the closet right so that tells yeah. you that space really hit home for a lot of people right so right. very interesting and it was actually one of those questions too like space planning right you came in early like like what do you see how everything is changing maybe a little bit you know everybody's talking about like COVID change floor plans and layouts a little bit but what do you think where stuff changes as far as, you know, we used to have enclosed kitchens, now it's open floor plan. What's the next evolution of floor plans? I'm super pragmatic about the architecture, right? So for me, I look at, like, all the boxes that that closet represented, right? It was going to be two or three chambers, essentially, right? So what I did was I said, let me give all that space to one room. How much cabinetry could I get in there and how much, you know, living space could I get in there? So I kind of approach it in that way. Um, and then, you know, for example, that big open living room with the kitchen as part of the living room. Well, I knew that I wanted that to be the most elegant room in the house, but the kitchen was in the room. How do you do that? Well, it's, I kind of crafted it 
to where, and it came from Lori, who said to me. Lori is the seller and yeah, owner, the seller, for the record. The and by the way, the house was built for them, so that makes a big difference because the, the opportunities I had, the materials I was able to use, when you're crafting a home for yourself, it's different than when you're crafting it for an end user, unless you're me, and then you use the most expensive materials anyway, but... I think that um, in that particular case, she wanted to mediate, right? There's a series of conversations you have when you start on these projects. And she wanted to mediate this overlap because when you have young children, you have staff, you have things happening in the house. There's a lot of parties. There's a lot of actors. So you need to kind of figure out traffic flow. And she was like, can I just have a coffee maker that I don't have to get in the queue? (laughs) So I literally created this idea where I took, I think, a couple of closets that were behind the kitchen. One was going to be a walk-in pantry, and the other, I believe, was a closet you entered from the master suite and created this long, narrow butler's pantry and chef's kitchen. So that was never intended to be that kind of space. That's the kind of space that worked for this family because what it allowed you to do is not only have a great lifestyle component of being able to organize family and staff and have that kind of coexist without being on top of you, but it also allowed for the kitchen, the front kitchen, the family kitchen to be beautiful because the heavy stuff, the wash station is in the back kitchen. So you could close those beautiful doors. You could see into it, but you could close those beautiful doors and all the remnants of preparing a dinner could be behind those doors and you could go on with your fabulous life. So that was, a, that was one of the most challenging things, and that's why we also moved the entry of the house and created, took the dining room and made that into the entry so that you would have more of an approach into that space so the first thing you weren't seeing wasn't the kitchen, right? Because I think the original entry of the house was on the side. Yeah, but the, the bar area. Yeah. Yeah. So. so, you know, it's just kind of thinking about it. I, I, it's always down view for me. I look on the original footprint if I'm lucky enough to have it. Sometimes I have to create the footprint out of thin air. But I start to look at, like, patterns. I feel like I'm a little bit of an anthropologist at the same time as being a designer because I've now been able to, which I didn't have at the beginning, but I've now got this long kind of trajectory where I've seen how people live. And I've seen what's successful and what isn't successful. What Even something as simple as a traffic flow in a kitchen can make or break your day and make it a better experience or make it something that you're just constantly having to answer questions and you're not really getting to sort of start your day in a kumbaya. You know what I'm saying? Because when you're dealing with staff, right, in the first thing in the morning, everybody wants to get sort of what's the directive, where are we going, what are we doing? So sometimes you don't get the luxury of just kind of like having time with your family. You know what I'm saying? So there's it's working out those It's all just solutions to problems or solutions to things that could be better. So it's not just about creating beautiful rooms. I wish it was that easy. But it really is about having your ear to the floor on how people aspire to live. I I put everybody through these questionnaires of it's endless questions about, well, you know, what time of day do you think you're going to be in this space? Because the sun's really amazing at 3 o'clock. Should we put the bath in this room? Because wouldn't it be great to, like, what time do you take a bath during the day? Like you could literally create an opportunity that isn't doesn't exist, but will be transformative to how somebody lives in that space. So I kind of look at it like that. I look at sort of boxes, and I start creating. I'm very aware of where the sun is. And I don't know how many other people are really that interested in that, but it matters a lot to me when I'm designing these houses. So I'm just kind of looking at all of these variables, and then the boxes start to fill themselves out. And then it's just queries, like constantly touching base with the client to say, this is where I'm headed, this is the vision. For me, I usually get the snapshot pretty early on, and then I have to go through all of the steps to turn that into a buildable document, right? But usually it's like a snapshot, it's a photograph for me, and then I work backwards to get there. What was the what was the biggest challenge on the, on the Camino project? Um, and, and what are maybe most of the challenges that you face in every project right since you've been doing this for so long what do you think is are the main points there well i mean i think you don't have to go too far for all of the clients to say that the that the biggest challenge is time and then we go through what we've all been through on camino where the whole world changed right so what you 
what your sort of by rote, you know, operational aspect of a project is no longer what it is, right? So the next thing you know, there's like supply chain issues, there's staffing issues, there's, you know, vendors that don't want to go out and you get one person who's been exposed to COVID and then they have to quarantine for 14 days. Maybe not in Arizona, but in LA, <laughs> forget about it. Everybody was like, in the pool, I'm out. <laughs> Everybody was with the ice chest. They're like, oh, we got a doctor's note and this could go on forever and we're cool with it. But maybe here was a little bit different. But well, here we had people that had Corona on Mondays and they showed up Tuesday. Yeah, you know? see, Cause yeah, Texas too, the, I'm a Texan. The Wild West, the Wild West. Yeah, <laughs> the Wild West, I'm a Texan. It was just like that in Texas too. Yeah. Um, but all of our projects during COVID were out of, out of California. I had only one California project at the time. So I was, and people needed to get in their houses. So I realized pretty quickly that we were essential workers, my whole staff. So we were traveling to Miami, moving people in. We were working on a project here. We were all over the planet actually at that time. So we had to figure out really fast how we were going to make that happen. And so that was, had its own set of circumstances. But I'd say with Camino, the biggest challenge was that we encountered a life altering experience on the planet that did affect even if you everybody was willing to work if the materials couldn't get there that was you know that creates a problem right so I would say that there's a soft version of that that happens with all people it always takes a little bit longer than what you thought it was going to take and it always costs a little bit more and I always just tell people you got to build that in and trick yourself you don't even have to tell your contractor that you've built in that insulation you don't even have to tell your contractor that you've built in that time frame. You can still say that you want it for this amount of money and for this amount of time. But build it in for yourself so you lower your anxiety and you don't move your family out of a house yeah. prematurely. And then there's all this high-level drama around it. But How much, how, how much um, do clients really have uh, control of what you design, right? Because it's always like, you know, you always have to say, trust me a little bit. They hire you because you're the professional. They... Love your work. That's why they hire you in the first place. But then you present something and they're like, yeah, but I want it different. Like, how do you overcome these, like, uh, you know, the, the homeowner that becomes designer in the process and trying to, like... We're, we're asking for a friend. Yeah. We <laughs> might have oh, to really? deal with that every day. Oh, my God. That's so funny. <laughs> okay. So, let me tell you. There is a secret to it. I mean, I think half of, of design, like, the people who work, and I have to get the high-level jobs, half of it is talent. The other half of it is how you are, what your people skills are. You know that from your business as well. I mean, that's a big part of your business. It's, you have to know how to manage people through doubt, okay? So they, there's a, sometimes people have a lot invested in these houses. It's, take Hollywood, where I come from. These people, I don't come from there, but that's where I work predominantly. I'm a Texan. But sometimes these people have not grown up around, they don't have a silver spoon. They're, all of a sudden, they're the hot commodity, right? They've got their first film, their, you know, their directorial debut. They want their life right now. They want to start inviting people over to their house, and they might have been in a condominium in Simi Valley and, you know, schlepping in in, in the Pinto <laughs> to, to auditions. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, they have this opportunity to have a big life, and they want it right now, and they want the best designers to come in. So that can be tricky. The first thing is they have to be aligned with you. Okay, they have to, when I go on interviews, I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me. Because I know that if they aren't attracted to what I've already created, that there's not a language there that's, uh, that they're um, in simpatico with, then it's going to be an uphill battle trying to get them aligned with my vision. If they're showing me things that I wouldn't do in this lifetime, then I know that I'm not the right choice for them. But that there's always someone who will be perfect for that aesthetic, right? So you're better off to pass on the project and find the person that's more aligned with you than to try to spend your, you know, two years or whatever you are on that project trying to talk them into things that they don't understand. So that would be my first advice to, like, young designers would be learn, put your ears on, don't be so anxious to get that project that isn't aligned with what you're talented at and wait till the next one because it will come. But you don't want to get in situations where you're constantly having to prove your worth to somebody. It just doesn't work well. So, um, and so I think, and then your people skills, like just really managing people through any kind of doubt that they have. They, you know, and, and being so confident and so prepared 
in your choices, everything that I choose, I have a reference for it. I have a reason and a narrative behind it. It might look arbitrary. It might look like effortless. But there's actually so many elements in a room that create tension, that create a dynamic, that the layman wouldn't understand where it came from, but I know very well. So when they ask me a question about it, I can say, that doorway is there because of what you're seeing on axis beyond it. And that's going to get a, an emotional reaction from you when you walk down this hallway. Do you know what I'm saying? So I can see that where they can't, but if you can explain it and you can put it into context for them, then they're, then, and as they have a couple of those experiences with you, they don't even ask you anymore. They're just like, girl, you go. <laughs> you just do what you do. And those turn out great. And, but I'm very influenced. I notice everything. I notice the handbag that the client chooses, right? Because you can choose. You curate yourself. So I look at their jewelry. I look at their clothing. I look at how they live. I look at what interior they chose for their car. It can tell you very much about somebody. So I see, you know, where they would go on their own. And the challenge for me is how can I take them to a place that they would never have gone on their own? That's the excitement. How involved on Camino was uh, were Loria and Jeff, the, the, for, the, the current or former owners? Okay, so let me tell you, sometimes you're blessed and you get a client like these people because they had seen, they, she had followed me for some time and they had seen a project that I had just completed, a, a spec project that I had just completed in um, Los Angeles called Tiger Tail. It was on a road called Tiger Tail. And she wa they wanted to come see the house. They wanted to physically see it. And we had the meeting in that house, and they were able to walk and look and understand t the, all of the detailing. And they're detail people. So they have built many beautiful houses, and they've worked with many top designers, top architects. So I, it wasn't their first experience. So they knew enough to know that this project and their aesthetic and my aesthetic were a very good match. And then when we met and we talked about it, we actually at the time, interestingly, I just remembered this, at the time, they hadn't bought the house yet. They were interviewing me for a future project that to be determined. And then they found the house in, the, in its framing stage from you guys, because yep. you owned it at the time. And they were like, okay, we think we found the right thing to embark on. Interesting. So, they, so she knew she wanted to work with you. Yes. But project Without wasn't... Without a house I'd identified yet. And it came, I think, about, eight, we can ask her, but I think it came about eight or ten months later. So we had had this interview. It went fantastic. It's sort of like if you're on Match.com and you, like, have this date and you're like, damn, that was hot. Yeah. <laughs> but then it was like crickets. <laughs> but how often does that happen that somebody interviews you and says, hey, one day we're going to do something? Does it, it happen does frequently? Happen. Yeah. Interesting. And, and I, got, I got started because I was very practical about my business practices, and I was very transparent, which I also think is incredibly important in our business. And I think that I got started because of business managers. I, because of where I live, my first clients were just, you know, ridiculous people that were just, you know, the sky's the limit. So I didn't start in a small town and have to do, you know, like a couple of, you know, duplexes to move to the next thing and the next thing. My first, I'm not even going to say because I'm not a name dropper, but my first client was a very high-level celebrity. And I, you know, showed up to the project, and I was like, okay, well, let's just get this thing done. But I completely lost my train of thought of where I was going with that. What did you ask me? Uh, no, keep sorry. going, keep sorry, going. Sorry, I like sorry. it. No, I like it. Keep anyway, going. what was I saying? Help. Come back early Alzheimer's. Actually, it was tequila last night. Yeah. <laughs> no, please. Be honest. Windsor, please tell us first. First, uh, first client. You don't have to. Oh, you don't oh. have to mention the name, but but the experience no, I was of saying that. that. What happened was business managers would bring me in. Yeah. And they'd say, you know, we really like the way you worked with this client. We really understand your approach to the business. You're very transparent. That's very uncommon in your business. Do you know that? And I was like, you know what? I didn't come up through the ranks of like the the official interior design world where they have, you know, list and net pricing and all of that. I was raised by business people that were small, you know, small business people. My family, they were all entrepreneurs. 
But they always impressed upon all of us how important it was to be a person of your word. If you said you were going to deliver something, deliver it. Deliver it on time and better than what they expect. And then I also was taught that you're honest and you're transparent because you never have to cover anything up. If you're always truthful and you put your, you know, your, your business out there for people to understand, they can evaluate you fairly. But if it's like the, our business is kind of shrouded in secrecy, There's a, it's a very strange, I think a lot of the practices in interior design, if I'm going to be really candid, um, sh- you couldn't do it in any other business. It, you couldn't get away with it. And so I think there's a room, there's business for everyone. See, we live in a world now where the end user can get to the price of anything. We have the internet, right? So I never really understood why there would be different pricing, list price and net price, because there's really no such thing as a list price. List price is a retail price. But if you're a designer and you get a discount, right, and you forward that on to your client, and then you t- they have a contract up front that says, I make this percentage over what I'm going to sell you. And you value your design fee greater than you value how much someone's going to spend. They will never argue with that. And, if they, and so I feel like I moved from the position of being in competition with my client to find something to them wanting me to find everything because I'm giving them my trade discount and they're paying me a fee over. So it's not like I'm making some inflated cost on something and then I'm charging them money in addition over that. It's just, it's just too much. So it, all of a sudden I go from being their opponent to being their advocate. It's a very different dynamic. And I'm surprised they don't teach this in design school. Yeah, there's a lot but, of stuff they don't teach in school. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm hoping in the future to really uh, tackle that because I think that there's, if we can get it right – then I think it opens up the whole business. Because before you had manufacturers, they didn't want to reach over the designer because the designer was the mainstay of their business, right? But they wanted to get to the end user because there's a lot of people out there taking control of the design of their home, right? So how do you sell both? Right. So that wall, just like Reagan said, that wall must come down. Yeah. So one other question is, um, obviously, in community, you did the furniture too, right? And uh, yeah. I mean, we when we do specs and everything, everybody's talking about staging. Like, how um, how important do you think it is for the final product that the furniture has been done by the same designer versus? Because we see a lot of times, like they stage it and then they pull all the furniture out, and the the buyer comes back and like, what happened to the house? Like, that's not the house I saw, right? Like, it right. changes so much. Like, how how important do you think it is, and like how Hard, how hard is it to convince your clients or, you know, the yeah. buyer to it's a really, really good go question. with you? I think it's, it's, it's what spins the dream. I mean, you want to have a beautiful product. It's very important that when you go in and you look at the finishes in the bathroom and you look at the way the cabinets meet, that all that's beautiful and that the selection of materials are exquisite. However, the dream happens when people see how they're going to live in it, right? That's the story that you need to tell. So if that's what the furnishings do, it tells someone, they walk in, people had a visceral response to that house, and they had it because it wasn't staged. I saw the staging intention, what that was going to happen there, and my ego kicked in, and I was like, not that beauty, we're going to make that thing sing because it's too good of a house to not tell the story of how it was going to be lived in. So I feel like it really helps when you're doing a project that even though this one wasn't intended to be a spec, it was, but when a project is a spec, people should not sell it short when it comes to the furnishings. We didn't stage that house. We appointed that house. We furnished that house, just like we would if somebody were to live in that house. So I think it's incredibly important. And I, I mean, how many days did it sell? How many days did it take you to sell it? Less than two weeks, yeah. And that price point, yep. Yeah, and that price point, you set a new a new. Uh, a new price per square foot in that area now. Yeah, and I think, like, again, like that's why, you know, we got so much positive feedback, I think, right? Because a lot of people did see it during construction, you know, and did, like, you know, agent previews, and then they come back the week after, and all of a sudden they see furniture, and they're like, you know, it's almost another, a different house, right? It's a whole other yeah. level all of a sudden. So, yeah, we agree that's a very important thing that a lot of people skip on. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's painting that picture where someone can see themselves living in that house in a way that they wouldn't get to on their own. Like, if they were going to go down and, you know, 
go to Restoration Hardware and go to, you know, I'm not knocking Restoration Hardware, <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, if they were going somewhere accessible and didn't have access to a higher level of design, they would never have had that house. It's, you have to take a house to the next level. It's not, you know, for animals. I use that a lot. It's, it's not about, you can see it, you can find a lot of that. But when it really is carefully um, appointed, and I use that word because it's a higher level of thinking, don't stop short on a speculative product product by sh- by shortening. Allow for that expense. Allow because likely your end user will buy much of it or some of it or you know. Which is what happened on Camino too, yeah. right? I mean, I was shocked that they didn't buy every single thing. I was a little bit shocked by that, but not everybody can do that, right? But I, if, if I had imagined, because I had to kick into gear of, like, who, who would live in this house, and it was very much the client that we built the house for, right? But I was imagining that the person that was going to move into this house didn't have the time, had worked with designers all around the world, <clears throat> and they didn't have the time to really design the house themselves. They would much rather know that they could just come in and set their toothbrush down because time is money to people who have a lot of it. They made it somewhere. You know, they're busy. They have busy lives. They're, so I think understanding who that end user is is kind of what you try to do. You might not always hit it. There's surprises. There's people that come from left field, and it's the last person. Remember we had a funny conversation where I was like, I was all cocky, and I was like, I know my buyer. I know who likes my aesthetic. That, those are the people that are going to buy the house. We were close on, 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 on those ones, and I remember that, that couple, and I remember that conversation. But if you look at the actual buyer right now, other than maybe a slight age difference, yes. it's, it's pretty that's much the what same. That's me the most. That they were younger? Yes. Yeah, but see, that's what's fun about this, because there are surprises still. But I would have thought because of the geography here, right? I find that when I have come here in the past, I've found that, you know, there's an, a retiree element. There's off-season sports figures, right? And so a lot of the affluence that you see here and the people buying houses here are kind of seasonal. It's changing now. Now it's like a destination for a family. The schools are great. There's a lot of reasons why families are, are really, you know, investing here now. But I would have, if I had to put money on it, I would have bet that we would have gotten a very sophisticated, slightly older client, that their kids are grown, and that they want a beautiful house that they can just lock up easily, perfect size. They might have a, you know, 14,000 square foot house somewhere else, but this house represents for them ease. They want to come have their beautiful life here, however many months, play some great golf, have some great food, you know enjoy the sunsets, and then pack it up easily, and they're gone. I want to touch on that real quick, because uh, that's a good point that you... So you're doing, obviously, projects all over the country, right, all over the world. Um, how do you adjust for location, right? You said you do a project in Miami. Miami, obviously, by default, has a little bit of a different design and feel to everything. Like, how do you go into a project, you know, coming from the desert, and now you're going to the beach in Miami, and how do you switch and go with a you know, somewhat different design, but that's still staying true to, you know, what you do? Well, the truer word was never spoken because I, we built a jungle in Miami. We basically took Tulum and put it into Miami on the water and created this incredible Shangri-La that is, you know, raffia, big light fixtures that sway in the breeze and hammocks hanging from palm trees. Like, it couldn't be more the opposite of this kind of very sophisticated, um, arid environment it's like everything's damp and sexy and everybody's a little balmy and sweaty and lots of kids running around and everybody tan in bathing suits and it couldn't be more different and so um that was a cool thing I, that's what I love about my career honestly because I never get bored I get to dream in all these different ways that I mean you're just you hope in your lifetime you would have one of these dreams but I get to have them these re- you know always changing environments. And uh, the family that I worked on the house in Miami, we also bought it mid-construction. And it was going to be a very contemporary, but then we wanted to turn it into this islandy kind of thing. And I put a lot of radius doors and real thick plaster walls and brass huts and 
you know, it became something very different um, than what it started out as. So how lucky to be able to sort of jump back and forth between these aesthetics. And I can't wait for my next book because it's sort of like I might have to have more than one book because how do you, it's a mashup. How do we put this all together? And like you said, you know, have it have a common thread. I think the common thread is my love of family. I think all of these, there's, you know, the family that I created that for, they have, I've, this is my fifth project for them, going, going on my sixth. So it's, I know them by now, and each poem is sort of, has its own flavor and its own destination. So, um, yeah, it's kind of the dream job. I mean, whenever whenever I talk to you, I never know where you are. You know, <laughs> you're usually usually somewhere traveling in different in different cities. And I can from from the interactions that we've had on this project. I mean, we can we can both attest for that. You you truly love what you do, and you I mean, you're absolutely amazing. You know that. But I just wanted to say again, what I mean, it's just been nothing short of amazing working with you. And and there's a reason why I asked that question earlier. You know. Maybe there's a, maybe there's another opportunity down the road to do to oh do a project God, I together. Love that. Well, I do have to say too that um, my client on this particular project, and they have bought and sold the most beautiful properties, you know, around the world, and they said that this was by far the best experience they've ever had with a real estate broker, and that's a real feather in your cap because they've been in a lot of transactions, and I think you know I would take that as the highest honor to receive a compliment like that, I was like, damn, that's <laughs> impressive. Yeah, well, we love what we do too, right? So well, that's clearly, yeah. clearly. And you brought a lot of great energy to it. So you, I didn't have to reach far. Like, you were always a phone call away when, you know, and so helpful in the process of sort of inhabiting it and bringing it to life. And so we appreciate that. Windsor, what role does sustainability play in your projects? Eco-friendly, I mean, there are some nature elements and organic elements that are in, in Camino, but how important is that to you and and how do you incorporate that in your projects? Well, it's becoming very important. Um, we talk a lot about it. We're kind of pivoting my business in many ways to be much more conscientious and I'm asking more questions now. You know, there's there's things that you can do so easily. There's ash, concrete, you know, that instead of using the concrete that has, you know, a, a harsher impact on the planet, you can use ash that, you know, you reconstitute, and it's even stronger than concrete. Like, there's so many things that I've, I've taken the time to say, okay, I'm going to pivot some of my bandwidth to really understand how we can work in more simpatico with the environment. And I think in the interior design world in general – is wasteful because if you take just the experience of going to the design center and getting you know samples right well they don't in the design centers they don't even have like a drop box not the one in la so when you're done with those samples it's sort of like a big project you want everybody to come get their samples and repurpose them because they're expensive too but if they don't come out to to get them you kind of feel guilty i'm like well i'm going to throw them in the trash because we're moving our office or something so just that piece alone, forget the part about, you know, bringing product from you find something beautiful on first dibs and now you're bringing it all the way halfway across the planet on a freighter. Like there's all kinds of things that are impacting the environment, right? So I'm, I'm more and more interested in that because we have to, somebody's got to like start thinking about these things and, and setting an example of how it can be done. We used to think green product was like, you're like, mm, yeah, but I wouldn't choose that, right? Okay, so it meets all the requirements, but I don't want to see it in the house. So it really is an art form now, really looking at I mean, they're growing furniture out of mushrooms. Like, they're literally, <laughs> they're growing trees. They're trying to train trees to grow in the shape of a chair. I know it sounds insane, but it's true. So I'm excited to see how that is going to affect our environment. We were talking the other day about chlorophyll in plants. Plants are going to become the biggest thing. House plants. Like now it's sort of like there's three varieties and you shove that rubber tree in the corner or whatever. But now plants are going to become, they, the chlorophyll actually can hold light. So there's experiments being done right now of how to make your house plants actually a light fixture without, you know, pulling from the electrical board. 
it's yeah. kind of a shocking what's happening in that world, and I'm super excited by it. Let's see what, what happens. But I think if these great design minds get involved and take it to the next level, we're in for a crazy ride. Yeah, definitely a lot of interesting stuff happening. Um, okay, I think we kind of probably got to start wrapping up. You have a busy schedule. We know you got to get back to work. Um, so definitely wanted to say thank you again so much for uh, coming. My pleasure. Uh, it was great working with you. Obviously, uh, it was a huge success, the house and everything. Um, and then we also want to thank everybody for listening again, watching, and uh, make sure to subscribe and follow. And we're also going to leave Windsor's contact information, everything in the link below. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.